Good morning, true crime junkies. Oh, I have an old one for you today. 1931 in Phoenix, Arizona. This is Winnie Ruth Judd. Eventually, by the country, uh, the United States, she was called the Trunk Murderess. It's quite a story, uh, but it is long. It's kind of one of those things where you watch it all the way through. And it's kind of like a, the, the game Clue. So there's a lot of characters. And there's some surprises at the end. Um, if you've ever heard of an attorney uh, called Belli, he was brought in. So leave some comments. Let me know what you think. If it's too long for you, or if you have a suggestion on uh, another true crime uh video. So, I think it would be very satisfying. Have a great day. Bye-bye. To this day, one can only assume what happened inside the little duplex on North 2nd Street in Phoenix, Arizona at approximately 10.25 p.m. October 16, 1931. History accepts this much. Two young women were shot to death with a 25 caliber handgun fired by their former roommate, pretty, svelte, 26-year-old Winnie Ruth Judd, perhaps in self-defense. As well, someone, Mrs. Judd claimed it wasn't she, devised a plan to hack the bodies into pieces so that they would fit neatly into shipping trunks for tidy disposal. Taking the blame for both the killings and the mutilations, Winnie Ruth Judd earned the sordid moniker the Trunk Murderess. Over the years, and because of sleuthing supplied by many people, including investigative reporter Jana Bombersbach, the story of that night and its subsequent events have taken on a mean that reeks of political chicanery. With their research, a behind-the-scenes cabal has materialized that appears to have been wholly devoid of conscience in using the trunk murderess, the woman and that infamy, as its way to escape its thoroughly deserved punishment. Passengers in stylish Stetsons and feminine cloches rush to and from their trains amid the hustle-bustle of red caps and stewards and baggage men who staffed Los Angeles Union Station that Monday morning, October 19th. The human activity was accompanied by the shrill screech of arriving steam engines and the incessant, almost automaton voice of the clerk announcing departures and arrivals. Jerry Brooker, in blue uniform and wearing the blue round cap that identified him as a baggage checker, had been hard at work several hours already. All of the cases, trunks, valises, parcels and packages that had been unloaded from that morning's arrival of the Golden State Limited from Phoenix, Arizona, had long been picked up by their owners, but two trunks, he noted, remained on the flatbed truck. Checking his luggage list against those trunks, he ensured that those pieces did indeed come off the said train. He decided to wait a few more minutes before returning them to storage. Someone may call for them yet. Both were black with great silver latch-type locks. One was a large packer trunk, 40 inches by 24 inches by 38 inches, and had been weighed in at 235 pounds. The other was an average-sized steam trunk, 15 inches by 18 inches by 36 inches, weighing some 50 pounds less. Besides, he had a particular interest in talking to the owners of those two trunks. It was his job to act as inspector of any suspect luggage, and God forbid should he pass on any contraband such as illegal firearms or liquor. This was 1931. Prohibition was in effect, and he had been given strict orders from the Southern Pacific for whom he worked to keep an eye peeled for bootleg hooch or tommy guns in transit. But that pair of seemingly abandoned trunks surely didn't smell of alcohol nor of gunpowder. But they had an owner that he best described to himself as something foul, something nauseating. 
It wasn't uncommon for hunters returning from the mountains to try to smuggle their catch through rail customs, venison or deer or even bear meat. Worse, he had noticed a dark fluid dripping through the corners of the lid onto his truck. A few minutes before noon, Brooker noticed a Ford Roadster backing up toward the receiving dock. Alighting was an attractive young couple, a blondish woman with a face like movie star Norma Shearer and a handsome college-age male, several years younger than the woman. The former asked for her trunks, presenting a claim ticket for both. She and her associate ascended the few wooden steps to the platform. Brooker's boss, baggage agent Jim Anderson, with whom he had earlier shared his observations of the shipment, stepped out of his office and signaled to the other that he would take over. Have to ask, ma'am, what are the contents? Anderson inquired, thumbing her two large baggage trunks. Oh, nothing, personal articles, the woman answered. Anderson, as did Brooker, noted she seemed uneasy. And as she was closer now to him, Anderson thought she looked a trifle bruised about the face. Your personal items? the agent pursued. Er, yes, they're my trunks, she explained. She tried to smile. Sorry, I'm a little late picking them up, but I had to wait for my brother, she motioned to the boy, to drive over here and help me. They're rather heavy. Ah, I see, Anderson reasoned to remain personable. And yes, they are heavy. Ma'am, excuse me, but there seems to be a stench coming from inside each. Really? She intoned a surprise. A panic darkened her pretty features. Her brother, however, laughed. You're kidding. And he leaned over to sniff. One whiff and he grimaced. Hmm, you're right, sir. He turned to the baggage man, nodding. And look, Ruth, something seems to be oozing out. The woman intimated nonchalance. She claimed she smelled nothing. Well, maybe a little something. And as for whatever that was dripping, for the life of her she couldn't figure out what it was. After all, as far as she remembered, she had only clothing and ladies' private things stored inside them. Nevertheless, ma'am, Anderson sounded stern this time. I have to ask you to unlock them for my inspection. Please open the trunks, ma'am. The woman seemed hesitant, but opened her purse and fumbled around inside with her one good hand. Anderson now noticed that the other was bandaged, as though looking for the keys to unlock the trunks. My husband has the keys, she told him, and Anderson took it for a lie right away. When her inquirer offered to let her use his station phone, she declined, telling him that she would have to fetch her husband in person. She couldn't recall his phone number verbatim. Suddenly, she had alerted and, as both Brooker and his superior noticed, she could not wait to get away from them. On the same token, her brother seemed as equally puzzled as his sibling tugged him down the steps towards the automobile, not looking back, not once, as the Ford wheeled out of the lot. Suspicious, Anderson phoned the LAPD. A Lieutenant Frank Ryan answered the call. Hearing the railman's tale, the detective picked the lock of the larger trunk first. Even before he opened it, his decade of experience warned him, by the smell and its putrid leaking, to expect the worst. Opening the lid, he was momentarily overcome by more than the odor. Lifting a layer of rags and clothing from a corner, the decomposing face of a dead woman stared blankly back at him. He dropped the lid closed. Holy shit! A wail of a locomotive from the tracks beyond drowned out his expletive. Regaining his senses, he dared to examine both trunks. A headline article that would appear in the following morning's Los Angeles Examiner detailed what Lieutenant Ryan found. In the larger one was the body of an older and larger woman. She had been shoved into the trunk and partly hidden by a mass of clothing, blankets, letters, and a jumble of other material, apparently thrown hastily on top of the corpse. In the body of a younger woman were three bullet wounds. One was through the left temple, one in the left breast, and one in the left shoulder. She had been stuffed into the smaller trunk, for the body had been severed by a keen-edged instrument, cut completely into three pieces, but the portion from the waist to the knees was missing. Both women appeared to have been dead about two days. The missing pieces of the younger woman soon turned up. A janitor in the ladies' restroom at the depot discovered that evening a beige valise and hat box hidden behind the door of the ladies' restroom. Police recovered the items and, as they had with the two trunks, removed them to the morgue where they were searched. In the valise was the remaining lower torso, wearing shreds of pink pajamas. This was bundled in blankets. The matching hatbox contained a surgeon's kit of instruments, 
The type used to dissect a Colt 25 caliber automatic pistol, one box of 25 caliber Winchester cartridges, a bread knife, and an assortment of cosmetics. In no time, the police verified that the wayward pieces of luggage belonged to passenger Winnie Ruth Judd, who had boarded the train Sunday evening in Phoenix. Winnie, who most people called Ruthie or Ruth, was the daughter of Reverend and Mrs. McKinnell from Darlington, Indiana, plunked deep within the rural Methodist wheat belt. She was 26 years old in 1931, seven years married to a doctor whose practice had waned with his drug habit. It wasn't Dr. William C. Judd's fault, Winnie would protest, defending him, for he'd become addicted through morphine he received to treat a wound during the World War of 1918. Nevertheless, their marriage had been a disappointment, she needed a break. Life with Dr. Judd, her senior by 22 years, had never delivered its early expectations. At the time she met him, he practiced at a psychiatric hospital where she typed and filed. He was smitten with the cute, fragile, 100-pound dishwasher blonde who, in return, was overcome with his brain power. While dating, he spoke of adventure, of how he would love to travel the world, practicing his profession, she at his side. After they married in April 1924, they wound up in northern Mexico where her dreams of having a baby broke the monotony. Twice she became joyously pregnant. Twice she miscarried. Her frail, weakened form soon contracted a slight form of tuberculosis. Her husband placed her in a sanatorium in California. After this first attempt to recover her health, she tried several times to rejoin her husband in Mexico, following him from one indigent town to another. Tending to Mexico's poor spoke well of his principles, but this practice did not support a young wife who was neither accustomed to living in poverty, nor, more practically, was she physically strong enough to endure these conditions because of health problems. In 1930, she traveled back to the U.S. He remained in Mexico. Their communication was constant, but Ruth found she required more than X's on a letter. In 1930, she moved to Phoenix, Arizona, known for its tubercular relief. She cut her long hair and sported the fashionable bob cut of the day. And she fell in love with smiling, debonair, bedroom-eyed and saucy Jack Halloran. Her first job was as governess to the wealthy Lee Ford family, a position she loved. Halloran, Ford's next-door neighbor, proved to be a side benefit. Then, over-the-fence chats developed into much more, and every chance they had, she would steal from the Ford homestead and he from his wife and three children, for a rendezvous under the desert skies of Phoenix. Halloran was 44 years old and one of the town's success stories, reads Jaina Bomberback's heavily researched The Trunk Murderess. When anyone in Phoenix named the movers and shakers, Jack Halloran's name was on the list. If you wanted a political favor, Jack Halloran knew who to ask. People remember him as a take-charge kind of guy whose laugh could fill a room. He probably emanated a charm that the complacent William Judd never could, an exploded sexuality totally foreign to the good doctor. Phoenix in the early 30s, despite its jabs at modernity and a large population of good people just trying to live and let live, was in many ways still a Wild West personality, full of modern-day desperados. It uniquely bore the raw and rough and tumble-ahead, carefree rapport with life that was slowly disappearing in other, older cities, behind a somber, more prayerful and conscientious hope for industry thrust upon them by a national depression. Phoenix's boardwalks were full of the regular John Doe's who sought the most peaceful life possible. They had heard that Arizona, the newest state in the Union, offered that. Miles of desert between itself and other metropolises seemed to have cut, or at least escaped from, a reality of past problems. But the Desperados straddled the same boardwalks, and they were everywhere. They didn't come this time with a snarl, waving guns and staging shootouts at high noon. They smiled now and wore pinstripe suits and stole the advantage of the town rather than the money from its banks outright. They were rustlers, like Jack Halloran, who enjoyed running Phoenix like a Saturday night hootenanny and shooting from the hip with swagger and verbosity. The meter of their caliber was lethal, political savvy, and an assured grin. They were the roustabouts, boasting a clutch on the throttle of the town administration, scuffing their path with invisible spurs, even up the sacred aisles of Municipal Hall, to address the civic committees to promise their support for a more God-fearing and better Phoenix. Because Phoenix had grown basically out of the desert ether, 
that is, from a hitching post town to one with an emerging Art Deco skyline, it was able to creep up ungoverned while the rest of the country was unaware of it. The reformers were watching Chicago, as was New York and Kansas City and St. Paul, but Phoenix was viewed as a blossoming cactus of the Southwest, its needles albeit unobserved. On the surface, it wore a strict code of family morals and wedded loyalty, and most of the 50,000 residents practiced what they preached. But there was the element that found the motto, a city of homes, churches, and schools, a convenient mask to camouflage their lifestyles. There was a league of Jack Hallorans there, big biters and big takers and big kickers. Suddenly rich on the pastel Sonora Desert, they ran Phoenix for the pleasure of their own pocketbook and libido. Americans didn't think of Phoenix as a Gomorrah, and that was its greatest power. Jack Halloran was part owner of one of the largest lumber yards in this modern-day garden of sin, and owning a lumber yard in a burgeoning garden-turned metropolis is a virtue that speaks for itself. A member of the Phoenix Country Club, he rubbed shoulders with the denizens of smoke-filled political back rooms, mayors on down, as well as patrons of business who, because they hoped to maintain an industry there, became very adept at sawing. Yes, sir, mayor, with an efficient nod of the head. Jack probably started out as a yes-man, too, but now he was one of the rich and favored. Winnie Ruth Judd didn't realize the dangerous company she was giving herself to in the back seat of model citizen Jack's luxury sedan. She may have had misgivings. She continued to pour out her love to Dr. Judd in ink and, in fact, wrote him that she hoped he would come to Phoenix. But in the interim, she was obviously feeling the freedom of the new girl in town. Attracting male stares made her feel like a woman, not just a preacher's daughter. Sensing the space and experimenting with what a woman can find in that space, she was having the time of her unconventional life. After a few months with the Ford family, Winnie sought a financial step up as a medical secretary with a private Grunau clinic. Her salary of $75 was quite good for the year 1931. It afforded her monthly rent for a small cottage at 1102 East Brill Street, food in the Calvinator icebox, and a little left over to send her husband who had left Mexico for California, where he had admitted himself into a hospital for drug cure. Ruth's best friends were Anne Leroy, a 32-year-old Oregonian divorcee who was an X-ray technician at Grunau, and 24-year-old Hedvig, or Sammy, Samuelson, from North Dakota, who, because she was suffering from TB, had taken a hiatus from a teaching career. Before coming to Phoenix in early February of 1931, both these professional women worked in Alaska. It was there that they met, and where they decided to move together down south because of Sammy's worsening health. After their deaths, certain newspapers would hint at Anne's mannishness and term their friendship as a queer love, a derogatory term for lesbianism in the first decades of the 20th century. That they were bisexual might be true, for their relationship does seem to have extended to that. But, simultaneously, they also openly exhibited an interest in certain men, especially Ruth's male companion, who they called Happy Jack. They lived at 2929 North 2nd Street, in a small studio-type duplex, a trolley ride away, according to Bomber's back, from Ruth's Brill Street place. There they often threw small parties for Ruth and Halloran, and the latter's married business buddies whom he brought along for revel. He also brought crates of bootlegged booze. The men wined and dined the girls throughout the evening while their wives figured Hubby was at the office working hard. Rather, Hubby was hardly working. Because these nights of big business and big city dealings tended to leave behind them a wad of money for the girls' hospitality, one might conclude without so skeptical a mind that the hospitality may have included more than a tray of pastrami sandwiches and a leisurely bowl of popcorn. Ruth knew that Jack tended to visit the two girls on his own and would, many times, gift them rolls of greenery and bundles of presents. But according to what is known, she never balked. Still, author Bombersback hinted in her book The Trunk Murderess that beneath the amiability and, in fact, secret-sharing relationship the three girlfriends had, there was indeed a semblance of kinetic rivalry. If she had been a fool, Ruth might have totally overlooked Jack's generosity to her female friends. But she was not a fool. Jack, she determined, was not a benefactor Santa Claus. Anne was a tall, well-built, stunning brunette with chiseled features, 
and blonde, dimpled Sammy did not exactly leave men cold. Both were charismatic, fun-loving, and, what Jack liked best, adventurous. In autumn 1931, the three girls attempted space-sharing in the small quarters on North 2nd Street. Living under one roof produced problems, though. They began arguing daily, mostly over differences in housekeeping. Ruth was casual in her habits. The other two were obsessively neat. To placate, Ruth returned to her old digs at Brill Street. But a feeling of animosity was developing nevertheless, and not over tidiness. The bond between Anne and Sammy had always been impenetrable. They were sisters in one thought for so long, and, whether sexual or spiritual, they doted on each other, protecting each other to no extent. Anne was the breadwinner, and Sammy the homemaker. They were a family of two. Winnie, in a manner of speaking, was an outsider who, probably because she felt that way, had chosen to give them the freedom they needed to once again live the way they required. Not that she wished to penetrate their circle. She was independently happy and lost in the throes of romance with her Jack and fighting conscience over her betrayal of Dr. Judd. But, no doubt, the interplay that existed between her and Jack and Jack and her friends almost certainly caused a sensation of distrust among all parties. This negative underplay came to a combustive and startling, and deadly, head on Friday, October 16th, 1931. Trouble began to twitch the evening before, on Thursday. During the week, Ruth learned that Jack and his cronies had been planning a deer hunting party in the White Mountains of North Arizona. She offered to introduce Jack to a fellow employee at Grunau Clinic, a pretty young nurse named Lucille Moore, who had come from that part of the country and was familiar with its wildlife. Jack agreed to meet Miss Moore, and on Thursday, he first picked up Ruth, then Moore, and headed back to Ruth's house, where she had dinner in the oven. On their way back, Jack remembered that he had promised to stop at Anne and Sammy's house to see a couple of friends who were visiting there. Ruth felt uncomfortable because she had earlier turned down a dinner invitation, telling Anne that she had business that night. She hadn't wanted to go into the history of the planned hunting excursion and Lucille Moore's involvement. While her reasons are unclear, she might have sensed a fit of jealousy that would have raged had the girls known that she was introducing Jack to another good-looking woman. Later presumptions conclude that Ruth knew, or strongly suspected, that she had been sharing Jack's bed with Anne, and possibly Sammy, too. Jack went into the house to see his buddies, and Ruth's friends came out to say hello to Ruth and Miss Moore, whom Anne slightly knew from the clinic. Ruth observed no resentment in their actions. They were highly cordial, even asked them to stay for dinner, which Ruth had to turn down because of her dinner waiting at home. It would not be until the following night that Ruth realized her initial suspicions had been correct. Anne Leroy and Sammy Samuelson hadn't liked the idea of pretty young Lucille Moore one bit. On Friday, October 16, 1931, Winnie Ruth Judd shot Anne Leroy and Sammy Samuelson to death. That's what history says, and, for that matter, what Ruth herself said. Details remain sketchy, however. To present a depiction of what seems to have occurred that evening and over the weekend, the following events are based on a transcript of a confession Ruth made to a sheriff after her trial. Evidence uncovered from the crime scene supports this story, including her testimony that she killed in self-defense. There are holes, nonetheless, considering sensible theories that sprang up afterward. None of these discredit Ruth, but they suggest that Jack Halloran's role in the crime was larger than his being the after-the-fact participant exhibited here. Ruth arrived home from work around 6.30 p.m. that Friday evening, fed her cat, then waited for Jack Halloran to take her to dinner. She waited until nearly nine when she realized Jack had stood her up. This wasn't the first time. Angry, she resolved to leave him waiting and grabbed the Indian school trolley to visit with Anne and Sammy on 2nd Street. She knew that they were playing bridge that evening with a mutual friend and figured she would join them. By the time she arrived, their company had departed, but the girls asked her to stay the night. The trolley line would shut down soon for the night, and since both Ruth and Anne worked at the clinic on Saturdays, they could go to work together in the morning. Ruth agreed. They dressed for bed but continued to sit up in their beds for a while, sipping warm milk and talking. That is when an argument started. Anne suddenly started berating Ruth for setting up the meeting between Jack Halloran and Lucille Moore. She claimed the nurse was being treated for syphilis and that in introducing Jack to her, she had endangered Jack's life. 
Ruth rebutted by saying that, firstly, she didn't expect Jack to be interested in more romantically, and secondly, if it was true about the woman's affliction, such information should remain in the clinic and not be made public. Name-calling erupted, and threats. Anne and Sammy joined forces to intimidate Ruth. They insinuated that she was a s**t, and wouldn't her husband be happy to know how she was sleeping around? Ruth counterattacked by admitting that everyone at the clinic considered the two as lesbians, and no more than perverts. When Anne, in retaliation, threatened to tell Jack about Moore's disease, Ruth swore that, if she did, she would tell the doctors at the clinic how Anne had, in a fit of rage one day, purposefully broke an expensive piece of X-ray equipment. This was no longer just a quarrel between girlfriends that would eventually end in tears and promises to forgive and forget, Jaina Bomber's back asserts in The Trunk Murderess. This was now a bitter fight with each side threatening to destroy the other, socially and financially. The verbal daggers had pierced enough, Ruth determined, and left the bedroom to put her cup of milk in the kitchen sink. The time was, Ruth estimated later, about 10.25 p.m. From the corner of her eye, she saw movement and heard a grunt. Turning, she saw Sammy behind her with a gun whose barrel she placed against her chest. Ruth screamed, shoving the gun away, simultaneously reaching for a bread knife from the kitchen counter. The women grappled, and the gun discharged a bullet into Ruth's left hand. She faltered and, as Sammy re-aimed at her chest again, Ruth stabbed Sammy across the shoulder in self-defense. Both women were stunned, but recovered instantly, only to fall to the floor. Locked and fighting over possession of the firearm, it fired, striking Sammy in the left shoulder, but the latter still held on. As Ruth testified, I grabbed the gun and her hand was yet on the trigger when that shot went through her chest, and she never relaxed on the gun one bit until after she was shot. In the meantime, Anne had approached them, smacking Ruth atop her head with an ironing board, yelling for Sammy to shoot, shoot her. After Sammy lay still, Anne continued to brain her with the board and wouldn't stop despite Ruth's cries. In getting up, Ruth, now in control of the gun, thought it had discharged again and that the shot had gone wild because she had no time to pause between Anne's wallops. Anne continued to batter until Ruth was forced to fire. All action was a blur, she wasn't even sure how many times she shot in Anne's direction. She seemed to recall Anne listing, then recoiling, but that too was part of the bad dream. Dizzy, she must have wavered for a moment, because it wasn't long after that she found herself on the floor, aching, flanked by two lifeless bodies. Anne's body had fallen, according to Ruth, back towards the stove. Sammy's head was in towards the breakfast room, the feet towards the kitchen door. I must have fallen too, afterward, because when I came to, I was sitting on the floor. I put my dress on and nothing else, just my shoes and my dress. She went straight back to her house to get her pocketbook. The ride home took a little longer than usual since the trolley line was closing and she couldn't take the car the full way. She walked the last few blocks to her doorstep. When she arrived home, about 11.30 p.m., she saw Jack Halloran waiting there, dead drunk. Her intention had been to call her husband, but Jack talked her out of it. Instead, she relied on his help. I told him what had happened, but he wouldn't believe it, and I couldn't convince him. To prove it, she had him drive her back to North 2nd Street. They parked on adjacent Pinchot Street, and then entered the scene of the fight through the front door. After examining the aftermath, Halloran picked up Sammy and carried her to Anne's bed. Then he dropped the corpse onto the mattress, Blood spattered from Sammy's hair across the mattress and walls, tiny drops of blood. Ruth, meanwhile, began to mop the kitchen tiles, but broke down and could not finish. She was shaking. Her left hand, which had taken a 25 caliber bullet, throbbed like the devil. Jack completed the job himself. He seemed annoyed when Ruth suggested giving herself up to the police. He scared me of the police. He scared me of the state's attorney. He scared the life out of me, what it would mean. He told me that he could take care of this himself and that everything would be all right, but to say absolutely nothing to no one. Jack insisted that he let an associate of his, a Dr. Brown, come over to attend to her hand. When Ruth protested, worried that the doctor might, in turn, implicate Jack in the crime, the latter smirked and ensured her that Brown would prove to be a willing accomplice. According to Ruth, Jack said he had enough on Brown to hang him. 
Several attempts to reach Brown by phone failed, however, and Halloran never mentioned his name again. The mopping completed, Jack carried a good-sized packer trunk in from the garage. Because she was still hysterical, he insisted that she go home, he would drive her, and that she calms down. He would return alone to the girl's house, he said, to finish up what needed to be done. His plan was to force the two dead bodies into the trunk and dispose of it in the desert. She agreed that that might be the best for everybody. On her way out of the house, she dropped the murder weapon, a 25 caliber Winchester revolver, into her purse. Ten minutes later, she was home but spent the evening weeping and wringing her hands, wondering what Jack was up to and hoping that he would remain safe. Early in the morning, she called work and begged to take a day off, but her employers insisted she come in. To avoid suspicion, she obliged. Performing her duties was difficult, not only because she was on pins and needles, she hadn't heard from Halloran, but because she was in pain from the gunshot. Her hand festered and felt swollen under a bandage she had applied hours earlier. Finally, about noon, Jack phoned her. He asked that she meet him at the girl's house that evening. They needed to talk things over. She did as he asked, taking the trolley directly to North 2nd Street from work. Entering the front door, Ruth was disappointed to see the packing trunk still there, hoping it was gone. Halloran explained that it was too risky dumping corpses in the countryside. The highway patrol scoured those roads constantly. And besides, if the remains were ever found, Ruth would be implicated immediately, being their friend and one-time roommate. Jack opted for another plan, that she take the trunk herself to Los Angeles, where it could be gotten rid of safely, away from Phoenix. He wanted me to take it, and he said there would be someone there to meet me at Los Angeles, Ruth reported. That he had a man by the name of Williams or Wilson who would meet me. The plan made sense. It appealed to Ruth. Dr. Judd currently lived there. He could remove the bullet. Also, she had wanted to visit her brother, Burton, who was attending college in Los Angeles. And, as Halloran underscored, the trip gave her an ideal double alibi for going to L.A., to see her husband and brother, just in case questions were asked later. Jack promised to get her a ticket for the Golden State Limited Express train leaving Phoenix the following evening for the West Coast. She nodded. So that Mr. Wilson could identify her at the busy train station, she told Jack to tell him to look out for a short, thin blonde in a brown suit. But there were other things to consider first, before L.A. and brown suits. As for those other things... They had been neatly packaged in the trunk. Ruth's eyes surveyed the gruesome black oblong thing. You were able to fit the girls in there? She asked. I forced Anne in the bottom, and, well, there wasn't a whole lot of room left. Sammy was, er, uh, operated on. That's the only way they would both compact, Jack admitted. Ruth grew nauseated at the thought, even though, she noticed, he had chosen the more discreet, operated on, over the harsher, cut up. Her eyes rejected the sight of the disgusting object. Halloran then left her alone at the house-turned-mausoleum while he went off to procure a train ticket for her. It would be waiting and paid for at the ticket window, he explained. He also left her a phone number for the Lightning Delivery Service. Call them ahead of time, he directed, and have them ship the trunk to the station. They'll load it on the train you're taking and it'll be waiting for you and my associate when you arrive in L.A. You're sure that this Wilson or whatever his name is will be there when I am? Trust me, he patted her hand, and left. She believed him, everything he said, especially that he would keep in touch with her. He lied. No contact would meet her in Los Angeles, nor would he ever try to see her again. After that night, it was as if he had never known her. Never cared. To paraphrase the old moral about the best laid plans, Ruth's went sour. When the drivers from Lightning Delivery showed up later Saturday night, they told her the case was too heavy to be shipped by rail freight and advised her to separate whatever was in it into two boxes before sending it on. Caught unprepared, she told them to deliver it then to her Brill Street address. The tradesmen thought her request and her bearing were very odd, but she was the customer. They transported the trunks and Ruth to Brill. In the early hours of Saturday night, Ruth was left alone with the gruesome task of dividing up the contents of the bodies into other containers. I had to, she later justified her actions, 
because that trunk was too heavy to go by express and I didn't know what else to do. She had tried to find Jack to help her, but he had disappeared. According to her testimony to come, she removed several of the smaller anatomical slivers from the packing trunk with a Turkish towel into a larger steamer trunk she had had at home for storage. As she sickened and the macabre task overwhelmed her, she sought the relief of fresh air outside before plunging back to her chore. Wanting to end this hell as soon as possible, she decided to try another strategy. I didn't lift the body parts. I lowered them over the edge and they fell into the lower trunk. The piece I lowered, it was on top. I pulled it over the edge into the larger trunk at the side of it. I had the big trunk and the little trunk at the side and I pulled the latter over the edge and lowered it into the other. You can't lift that big trunk. After she felt she had equally dispersed all pieces, she quickly drew out one more grisly section from the smaller trunk and stuffed it under the wads of soft materials in her valise. The glance she afforded that final cutting told her it was Sammy's severed limbs. When the revolting session was done, she raced to the bathroom and released from her gut the curdling horrors of the weekend. By then, the Sunday sun had risen to erase the gloom and vapors of the night. Only one hurdle remained this morning, October 18th, getting the two heavy trunks to the train station for the 8 o'clock evening departure of the Golden Star Liner. Again, Jack Halloran proved inaccessible, and she hoped he had at least fulfilled his promise of reserving her a seat on the train. For muscle, she sought the help of her landlord, Howard Grimm, who lived in a small house behind hers. Grimm was delighted to lend a hand and promised that he and his son Kenneth would stop by her place at 6.30 p.m. to get her to the depot on time. At the appointed hour, Ruth pointed them towards the bedroom, where they found two black trunks. Grimm recalled grunting as he tried to lift the big trunk. Mrs. Judd apologized for its weight, explaining that it contained her husband's medical books. It took the strength of two men to carry the trunk to the touring car, but Kenneth managed the smaller trunk himself. Winnie Ruth carried out a battered suitcase and a hat box. When weighed at the station, the large trunk came in 170 pounds overweight. Ruth's heart fell, sure that the handlers would refuse to accept it. But when she was told she would have to pay $4.50 extra for its excess weight, she realized she was home scot-free. The baggage man then clipped a numbered claim check to each of the trunk's handles, had her sign the receipt, and wheeled the things from her sight. She watched, thankfully, as they disappeared behind the baggage room door. Picking up her ticket, Jack had prepaid it. She boarded the train and rested her head back upon the cold leather of the cushion. Through the skylight grating, she could see that the sky overhead had darkened. A few stars twinkled in easy harmony. Twelve hours from now, she would be in Los Angeles. Twelve hours. She hoped Jack's Mr. Wilson would recognize her. She wore the brown suit, the one she told Jack to tell his friend to watch for. Twelve hours. What would become of the trunks, she didn't know, hadn't asked. She didn't need to. She knew that Jack always had a way of getting things done. He knew people, knew how to deal. This time, she was sure, would be no different. But at Los Angeles Union Station, Mr. Wilson, or Williams, or whatever his name was supposed to have been, never materialized. And when she phoned, the Halloran's housekeeper told her the master was not available. He had gone hunting and would be unreachable for quite some time. It didn't take the newspapers long to find a name for Winnie Ruth Judd. And it was the trunk murderess, plain and simple. For a while, they toyed with the tiger woman, but that seemed too generic and didn't quite fit the genre of this woman whose petite, angelic face ran largely on the front pages of every newspaper across the nation. It was the kind of face that men fell in love with and women gaped at, unable to understand how a face like that belonged to, obviously, a femme fatale. They thought that if a Hollywood director were to cast someone in a role of a character whose activities resembled her insidious actions, they never would cast anyone who looked like Winnie Ruth Judd. Newspapers clawed for information, anything they could find on the Indiana preacher's daughter gone haywire. They uncovered her clothing sizes, her favorite foods, her bouts with TB, her family's first names, her marital history, even that she had a suspected boyfriend named Jack Halloran. And in the morals-conscious milieu of 1931, the fact that she may have been adulterous 
met with as much scorn as her alleged murder. Major gazettes offered rewards for her capture, and every columnist in every city fell upon each other for hot-button tips and the latest police findings in Phoenix and Los Angeles, the two cities currently sharing a history of the Winnie Ruth Judd crime and getaway. While Los Angeles police combed their city for Winnie, who had vanished into thin air after departing in haste from the train station, they wasted no time in tracking down her husband, Dr. Judd, and her brother, Burton McKinnell. After briefly questioning both parties, they quickly realized that neither of them, who had strong alibis for their whereabouts over the weekend, had any previous knowledge of the crime. William Judd was clearly overcome with shock and anxiety. Burton, because he had accompanied his sister to the train station to pick up the telltale luggage, had at first been labeled a solid suspect, but his explanation of how he innocently happened to be with her was quite satisfactory. Ruth had shown up on campus looking for him after her L.A. contact fizzled out. Knowing there was no one else to help her, he dodged his classes and drove her back to the station. It was only after they pulled out of the depot that he realized his sibling had no intention of retrieving them and was, in fact, preparing to go into hiding from the law. As they cruised through Los Angeles' lunchtime traffic, she grew more frightened. When he asked her jokingly, Ruth, what's in that trunk, a man or a woman? She answered quite solemnly, I'm not going to answer any questions, and I can justify everything. She refused to talk about what had happened, her brother said, interested only in getting away. She asked me for money because she said she had to leave, and I said I think it's the best thing you can do. I wish you all the luck in the world, kid. And she left. Making him pull alongside a downtown curb, she lit from his Ford and melted into the noonday crowd. After an unparalleled manhunt, she was found on October 23rd, hiding in, of all places, a funeral parlor. When questioned, she replied, I am Winnie Ruth Judd. Hungry, disheveled, worn, she accompanied police to the jail where reporters enveloped her. I had to do it, she moaned. I had to. But with the first stuttering of self-defense, the entire case turned topsy-turvy. No one, the public nor the police, expected it. When newscasters announced the killer was apprehended, America braced to meet a snarling hydra gloating over her wicked, wicked ways. Instead, they were introduced to photos in a newspaper of a wide-eyed, tearful waif in handcuffs, whose visage bespoke a blend of crucifixion and apology, and whose sobs of, I had to do it, brought the house down. Almost from the start, America sympathized with her. All except Phoenix officialdom. Looking back, Phoenix was very much a coliseum of lions, and Winnie Ruth Judd, the hapless Christian. Awaiting her extradition back to Arizona, the town's administration turned curiously and vindictively bent on Ruth's destruction to the point of sabotage. City authorities closed ears to debate. Belief in City Hall Phoenix was that Ruth Judd had killed her two victims in cold blood while they slept. To corroborate this, they pointed to the fact that the mattresses of both the girls' beds were missing, a finding that, when Ruth first heard it, puzzled and shocked her. The last glimpse she had had of the bedroom, the mattresses were in place upon Anne and Sammy's beds. But, in the detective's assumption, the only reason why a suspect would have disposed of them was that they were soaked by incriminating blood. There was a splattering of blood on the walls near one of the beds, and Ruth knew that must have come from Jack Halloran's transporting of Sammy to the bedroom. But they refused to listen to her explanations about the mattresses or the splatters. The intrigue was growing. She felt a tightening, and her words were not being heard. After all, they were falling on those deaf ears. To keep the smoky light of guilt on Ruth, Phoenix administrators kept autopsy reports of the murdered women vague. If they had not, the American public would have read that the mutilations performed on Sammy were not mutilations at all. Whoever cut up the girl had been experienced in anatomy. The dissections were clean and accurate, and not performed by an amateur like Ruth. As well, police also surfaced their discovery of an ominous letter written by Sammy Samuelson the day she died. The three-page document, addressed to her sister, was found unmailed at the scene of the crime. To the press, a police spokesperson cited a fragment of that letter as reading, 
We're much happier by ourselves as Ruth and Anne clashed on so many things and their quarrels were sometimes violent. The actual letter read, We are so much happier here by ourselves. Ruth and Anne clashed in many things. We get along so well, but it shows that there has to be a lot of tolerance which comes from love. When Ruth told her story to the police, she spoke of a scuffle, of Sammy attacking her with a pistol, of a 25 caliber bullet entering her hand while she tried to ward off the attack, of Anne clubbing her with an ironing board. She was left with bruises that, if appraised honestly by the police and prosecution, would have held weight in her defense. When arrested, Ruth received emergency surgery to remove the bullet that had lodged in her palm. The hand had turned gangrenous. In the same examination, Dr. Grace Homan found an extraordinary number of fresh welts, cuts, and discolorations, 147 of them, across her body. They were the type usually produced by assault. Photographs still extant today were taken that graphically depict the extent of the injuries. The attending physician's diagnosis was that, as she later wrote, Mrs. Judd put up a tremendous fight for her life. But, somehow, the diagnosis and photographs of the wounds that Ruth suffered evaporated from the investigation report as if they had never existed. Police called Ruth a liar. Of her hand wound, they proclaimed she shot herself after the fact on Saturday to insinuate a struggle the night before. They had not uncovered one person who saw Ruth with a bandaged hand the day after the supposed attack. So they asserted. Yet, in the most botched and plotted mishap of the whole investigation, they ignored the testimonies of five people who vouched they had seen her left hand bandaged early Saturday morning at work, as well as a crucial piece of testimony given by a streetcar driver who drove her home Friday night after the fracas. Patients Grace Mitchell and Stella and Mike Kirkies saw the bandage and commented on it that Saturday morning at Grunau Clinic. Medical Secretary Faye Aries and handyman Emil Clemens vividly remembered her left hand in gauze. And as for the trolleyman B. Yogemeyer, he had told police that when he picked her up at approximately 11.30 Friday night to take her back towards her home, her left hand was completely wrapped. In retrospect, the bandaged hand did not fit with what the police wanted to say, that Ruth shot and killed her two friends in their sleep, butchered the bodies, shoved the pieces into an array of portables, went home to sleep soundly, appeared at work the following morning, blew a bullet into her hand for an illusion of innocence in case she was suspected, then proceeded to machinate her escape plans to Los Angeles. The reason for the suspected cover-up? To shield Phoenix's man of the hour, Jack Halloran. Ergo, had Ruth's hand been accepted as actually invalidated during the melee, then there wouldn't have been a ghost of a chance for any sane man or woman to believe that a 100-pound woman, by herself, with tuberculosis, and with one good hand, and lifted the much heavier Anne Leroy into a trunk, cleaved Sammy, cleaned the house, and disposed of the mattresses. Quite evident of Phoenix's fear of itself, that is, its reputation, was the fact that when Jack's name became implicated in the bloody mess, as either Ruth's boyfriend or as an alleged accomplice, all papers across the country, except in Phoenix, printed his name. According to Miss Bombersbach, the Arizona Republic and the Phoenix Gazette referred to him only as Mr. X. Several neighbors had spotted Halloran's automobile on North 2nd Street, parked near the scene of the fatality, on both Friday and Saturday evenings. Ruth's neighbor, idling in the suspect's driveway on Friday, had also seen it. Police heard them out, checked the reported license plates against state records, and concluded the car, a gray Packard, was indeed registered to Halloran. Sharp newspaper men got a hold of this bit of dynamite and, as every other major news outlet in the Union ran the information page one, the local press in Phoenix simply disregarded it, as did the police when they failed to include the findings in the prosecutor's dossier. While American newspapers continued to consider a possible other-person theory, Phoenix mouthpieces refuted it. They disregarded Mr. X's presence as hearsay and never took pains in pursuing either in a better or, for that matter, a motive that might have involved anyone else outside of Mrs. Judd's personal jealousy and animosity. Considering all this, imagine the behind-the-scenes dither that must have ensued when the International Wire Service leaked a report that a diary belonging to Anne Leroy had been discovered in her home, a diary that named certain members of Phoenix's upper elite 
who had patronized the two women. According to The Wire, the alleged diary contained intimate details of the slain girls and their bows. The state's attorney's office was forced to admit its existence, but refused to comment. Everyone wondered what was in that diary, and whom. From its suggestion, it sounded like it name-dropped not only Jack Halloran, but also several other married and prominent men in town of recognized high standing and moral caliber. Hanky was the name, and Panky was the game, wrote Don Derrida, a well-known Arizona journalist, in afterwards summing up the hypocrisy that these men led. They played the community pillar, but cracked its foundations in the interim. Respected and likable, they glossed their activities by pose and charm. But, of the general public, very few were fooled. They learned about the summer bachelors, who sent their wives and children away to the cottage every June and July so they could party with the single pert young girls who saw their chance for a job promotion, a diamond ring, a fur coat, or perhaps an advantage they could store away until they thought of something specific. Releasing Leroy's diary would have probably meant ruination for too many people, instant ejection from high seats, and an embarrassing scandal all around for Arizona. But whatever chaos ran amok among the conspirators was brief, for soon all further mention of the reputation breaker was muzzled. Prosecutors forgot it, and the diary never found its way into Ruth's trial. The dissemblers remained safe. Among the dark knights of Phoenix, there was one, one, who wore shining armor and meant it. Sheriff John McFadden believed that there was much more to the story than the local yokels were being fed. From Ruth's incarceration through her trial and afterwards, he would prove to be Winnie Ruth Judd's greatest ally and lifesaver. What set McFadden on his course were the autopsy pictures of Sammy Samuelson's cut-up body. Helen McFadden, the sheriff's daughter, recalls that in viewing the photographs, her dad came to the conclusion that the dismemberment had to be done by a professional, a surgeon or a doctor. He said Ruth was incapable of doing it. Ruth had remembered that Jack Halloran had told her Sammy was operated on. She assumed he was telling her, in the most polite way, that he disjointed her carcass. In her confused and frightened state, she hadn't stopped to consider anything else. Unless autopsy prints lie, which of course they don't, Halloran could not have performed such a neat, clean job as illustrated. Who could have done it? Scholars point to one man, Dr. Charles W. Brown, the same physician who Halloran claimed lay in his debt. One theory is that Halloran, who had earlier tried to reach Brown to remove Ruth's bullet, may have at last found him after he brought Ruth home. The two men very likely returned to the death house on North 2nd Street, where the intimidated Brown conducted the dissection. Not long after Ruth was incarcerated at Arizona State Prison, the warden heard from the guards that a man calling himself Dr. Brown, drunk and disorderly, had wobbled into the front office insisting to see Winnie Ruth Judd. When they asked why, he blurted, because I am the only man alive who knows the truth. Before they could quiz him further, he hot-footed. A few days later, he died. The coroner pronounced it a coronary, but many believe he had committed suicide. Sheriff McFadden's initial suspicions were becoming concrete as incidences such as these prevailed. The lawman's real contribution, however, will be discussed later. But it adds to the story now to mention that, during his independent investigations, he was proving a source of worry to someone. Says Helen of her father, he was getting telephone threats that something would happen to his family if he didn't back off. McFadden would have had a confederate had Hugh Ennis worn a badge in 1931. Ennis, a 22-year veteran with the Phoenix Police Force, was not a professional lawman during the Judd trial, but joined the muster roll later, working in the homicide, vice, and narcotics departments. The force that he knew was nothing like the politically run group of the 30s. He's proud to have been a member of what he considers an honest, hardworking, and intelligent organization. He retired as a captain in 1981. However, he openly condemns the botched and suspicious way the Winnie Ruth Judd investigation was handled by his predecessors. So much smacks of exactly what it probably was, political interference, he told Jaina Bombersback when she interviewed him for her expose, The Trunk Murderess, early in the 1990s. Ennis has studied the case for years. He's read the original police reports 
and has gone over everything relating to the case that he could get his hands on, published and non. In reviewing the trial transcripts and copies of police interviews with eyewitnesses, he presents his overall judgment of the case. The police indeed took care of the investigation so that the pieces fit someone's private puzzle, not the truth. The police sent officers out there who let reporters traipse all through the place. Right then, they no longer had a crime scene. Any crime scene integrity was gone. Who knows what evidence was destroyed as these people were milling around? Who knows what was moved or taken away? Who knows what fingerprints were wiped out? The police clearly acted like this was a small hick town the way they handled this case. To make matters worse, says Ennis, the county's blood expert didn't arrive to take blood samples until 28 days after the murders, and after the landlord had opened the place to the public, charging admission to literally thousands of curiosity seekers who paraded through it. By then, Ennis reports, blood sampling became a useless gesture. Ennis cannot understand how the state could uphold their claim that Winnie shot her two friends in the bedroom while they slept. He attests, There just wasn't enough blood in that bedroom. If she'd shot the woman, as the prosecution said, there should have been a lot of blood in that bedroom, around both beds. You don't kill somebody, especially shooting them in the head, without a lot of blood. The lack of blood in the bedroom alone shows the state's theory was wrong. So, where and how were those girls killed? Ennis continues. And why would Ruth Judd make up a story where she admits shooting them, but puts the shooting in the wrong place? What did she have to gain? If she was there, she's got to know what the physical evidence shows. Why didn't she say the fight happened in the bedroom if that's the only place she knows the blood will show up? It doesn't make any sense that she'd insist the girls died in the kitchen, unless that's what she remembered. Those are the questions the police should have been asking, but they weren't. His views on the disappearing mattresses were plain and simple. There was either something on the mattresses the perpetrator didn't want to be seen, or the mattresses didn't fit the state's case. If there was no blood on them, how do you explain a scenario where the girls were shot in their beds? Ennis notes that the missing mattress factor should have been considered a highly important focus. The police quickly dropped the issue and no investigation took place. A conscientious police force would have recognized the value of those mattresses as evidence, and a hunt to find them would have been mandated. One more point. Why would Ruth Judd conceal the bloody mattresses, yet leave blood across the walls that the police claimed was there? Proving a defendant's premeditation of his or her criminal activity is a vital part of a prosecutor's job. But, again, the state failed in that area. To show premeditation, you have to show where the gun was that night. If she came over to kill them, they had to show she brought it with her. They didn't do that. My guess is they didn't because they couldn't explain where the gun was. There were never any tests done to see if she'd ever fired a gun, a dermal nitrate test. It can even tell what kind of gun was fired. Of her actions in the week prior to the killings, there was nothing to suggest a plan. She wasn't conserving her resources to make a getaway, adds Ennis. The evidence you see presents a picture of a person caught in a predicament who has to improvise. I couldn't take the evidence the police gathered and get a case through a preliminary hearing or a grand jury to say nothing of a murder trial. You'd pull the stunts today that they pulled and the judge would tell you, get out of town. He'd throw the case out. Jury selection for the long-awaited trial of Winnie Ruth Judd commenced on January 19, 1932 at the Maricopa County Courthouse in downtown Phoenix. Both the defense and the prosecution were very particular whom they selected to sit on the panel. The high-profile nature of the murders had generated distinct opinions by everyone in the county, and worries of a mistrial over a slip of a tongue or a nuance of bigotry were very real. The state chose to try her for the death of Anne Leroy only, to be followed with a separate trial for Sammy Samuelson afterward. The second would never occur due to subsequent events. Presiding over the three-week Leroy murder trial, an event in itself that condemned Winnie Ruth Judd in a comparatively unsensational manner, was Judge Howard Speakman, who, as a former state prosecutor and defender, had queued up a brilliant career. Popular county attorney Lloyd Doji Andrews headed the case for the state. Ruth had a combination of three lawyers, directed by well-known criminal attorney Paul Schenek, but none of these, even Shenek, was effective on her behalf. Less being more, 
they acted to surrender her to guilt before the trial began, more concerned with pleading insanity than exonerating her. The most anticipated event of the trial, the testimony proffered by the defendant herself, surprisingly and sadly never happened. That Ruth was not called to the stand disappointed Americans. Reporters in the courtroom described how she sat at the counsel's table, day after day, wringing her handkerchief, tugging at her bandage, pathetic in character, miserable by accusation, silent and dismal throughout. Much of the nation, in commenting on the suspicious nature of her being kept under wraps, so to speak, questioned her lawyer's abilities and the basic honesty of the ritual. Jury foreman Scott Thompson later revealed that much of the evidence laid forth against Winnie Ruth Judd was hard to understand because, he felt, it was presented by the prosecution in a confusing and illogical manner. The defense did next to nothing to contradict the prosecution nor clarify said testimony. Scott wasn't alone in his opinions. In researching the evidence on their own after the trial had ended, Thompson and other jurors were alarmed to find that certain important elements of the case, elements instrumental in helping them formulate their verdict, were not satisfactorily explained. Much seemed twisted to shape a particular conclusion. One of these concerned the mattresses supposedly removed from the girl's bedroom. The juror claims that he and his peers were led to believe that a mattress found in the alley parallel to the murder scene was definitely proven to be one of the victim's mattresses and was definitely blood-soaked. Neither proved true. Prosecutors stood their ground on accusing Mrs. Judd of having killed in a jealous rage. To support the motive of jealousy born from illicit love, they conjured up only two hazy witnesses, one that claimed Ruth was at one time angry at Sammy for trying to steal Jack, and another who spoke of seeing Ruth and Jack kissing and cuddling. Neither had heard her state words of violence, nor of revenge, nor of anything pertaining to a murder to come. And yet, by dropping from the jury all evidence that would have given another side to the story of Winnie Ruth Judd's relationship with the girls, or her last night in their company, they convinced it that the defendant was guilty. Defense counselors wavered, unarmed because they hadn't done their homework, then withered under the duress of a kangaroo court they assumed, going in, couldn't be beaten. Mrs. Kate Kunz, whose husband sat on the jury and who watched the trial proceedings daily, came away from the trial with two major impressions about what had happened, writes Jaina Bombersback in The Trunk Murderess. One, that Ruth Judd was guilty of shooting the girls, and two, that there was no question she had helped somewhere along the way. We never understood why Jack Halloran was never called, Mrs. Quinns remembers. His name was brought up so often in the case, he was sworn in, but he was never called to the stand. The jury reached its final verdict on the afternoon of February the 8th, 1932. She was pronounced guilty. And before the session ended, they elected that she should hang by the neck. Winnie Ruth Judd was placed on death row at the Arizona State Prison at Florence. Over the next several months, an appeals court juggled a verdict, her proponents wanting a mistrial. But eventually, the court reached its decision. It upheld the original verdict and punishment. Ruth was sentenced to die on February 17, 1933. Sheriff John R. McFadden was not content with the jury's verdict. After the trial, he convinced Ruth to talk to tell her side of the story, an opportunity she shamefully had not been given in court. As head of the jail where she was brought when extradited back from Los Angeles, he had heard her initial self-defense story the night she was brought in, a story so simple yet blown out of proportion and rebuilt in the meantime by others. Over the months as she'd sat in his cells, he and his wife often visited her, extending her kindness listening to her informally describe that bloody evening of October 16, 1931. On his own, McFadden had investigated elements of the crime, and from the sidelines, he watched those elements disregarded by the state, and his conscience bothered him. He felt that he needed to do something to save the accused from the burning stake. He made a last-ditch effort to, metaphorically, douse the fires the witch hunters had ignited. In the shadow of the gallows, her execution less than two months away, Ruth was brought from her cell at the state prison and placed at a table among several witnesses whom McFadden had gathered to listen to her. His aim was to bring the transcript to the grand jury to force a fresh hearing. He believed he could do it. Around the table that evening of December 18, 1932, 
were, besides Ruth and Sheriff McFadden, Oliver Wilson, Ruth's new lawyer, William Delbridge, the prison warden, Jeff Adams, one of McFadden's deputies, and a court stenographer. And she talked. Whatever method McFadden used to convince the grand jury to listen, Judd biographer Jana Bombersbach suggests that he might have even threatened to arrest Jack Halloran himself. He was successful. The efforts given by the convening grand jury proved to be not just another sideshow, but a body of jurors interested in American justice. On the stand, Ruth related the entire story, the way it happened. The argument, the fight, the attack on her person, the gunshots, the deaths, Jack Halloran's admitted operation on Sammy Samuelson, her flight to Los Angeles, funded by Halloran. Van Beck, one of the jurors, in recalling the case, remembers how the courtroom was spellbound as it heard, for the first recorded time, an altogether new version of the crime. New revelations spilling out of Winnie Ruth's mouth. Revelations that not only made sense, but were traceable to a source of truth. We didn't believe it was cold-blooded murder, he summarizes. We felt positive she was unable to cut up the body. We were told it took a professional. Most people in the valley knew other people were involved in this crime, but there was nothing they could do. The others involved were prominent married men. Then, two amazing things happened. Not only did the grand jury request that the parole board commute her death sentence to life imprisonment, it was manslaughter, it said not premeditated murder, but it also attempted to lighten Ruth's term further by bringing in someone who could support her story. It indicted Jack Halloran. McFadden eagerly volunteered to deliver the subpoena personally. The parole board chose not to make a decision concerning Ruth's death sentence until it heard the results of the Halloran hearing, although it postponed the execution to Friday, April 14th. In mid-January, Happy Jack appeared in court to a tremendous popping of flashbulbs and scratch-scratch-scratch of scores of reporters' cartridge pens, recording everything from his expression to the flashy necktie he wore. On the stand, Ruth retold the story of Jack's abetting, but this time, she often lost herself to hysteria when she saw her former lover's sneers. His presence in the courtroom was lethal, and his intimidating manner was not discouraged by the court. During testimony, the defendant would begin crying hysterically and, instead of answering questions, would rush off into a string of epithets. The horrors she was reliving were aggravated by the appearance of the victor who gazed at her in triumph. The preceding showed the system had little sympathy for Ruth. Again, after hearing her testimony, frenzied maybe but considerable nonetheless, it freed Jack of all involvement in the case. Judgment, said the court, was based on the fact that the woman's eccentric manner and personal involvement with her one-time lover spoke of a personal vendetta. No one ventured further investigation, nor was Jack brought to the stand. His lawyers spoke for him, and on January 24th, Happy Jack sauntered out never to be pulled back into this mess again. Ruth returned to death row to die. But the final hearing had not been a total waste, for it spurred public sentiment like never before especially in Arizona. The public simply believed she was innocent. McFadden had stirred the nations, and in particularly, the state's, conscience. Local newspapers began asking questions. The largest paper in Arizona, The Republic, had lined McFadden's doubts. The new warden of Arizona State Prison, A.G. Walker, intervened. Probably not without a reassuring wink from the governor, says Bombersbach and pleaded for an insanity hearing for his prisoner. It would mean, most likely, a life-term stay at an institution, but it was better than watching the lady being executed. There's good reason to believe that Judd has become insane after the delivery to the superintendent of the Arizona State Prison, Walker wrote to the parole commission. If the McFadden-Walker faction was suddenly pulling strings, at least they'd learned that to beat a game, one has to play as rough as the opponent. As if to get this business over with, Arizona's reputation and its judicial system were on the firing line. The state agreed to a sanity hearing, which convened almost overnight in Pinal County Courthouse near the prison. It opened on April 14th, the day Ruth would have died. About the hour she'd been destined to enter the execution chamber, she instead shuffled into the county's courthouse. This time, 
Ruth's newly appointed defense team maneuvered well. One of them was a young, brilliant attorney named Tom Fulbright, who would go on to become one of the state's most honored and honest jurists. What happened over the next 10 days was, speculatively, much of a stage show rehearsed by the good guys. Their efforts may have been affected, on the surface, for the benefit of the governor, but they were most assuredly done for the woman, Winnie Ruth Judd. The sanity hearing began. Winnie laughed uproariously, clapped her hands, and at one time rose up and said of the jury, they're all gangsters. J. Robert Nash explains the theatricals in Blood Letters and Bad Men. Another time, she said loudly to her husband, William C. Judd, let me throw myself out that window. In desperation, Winnie's mother took the stand to state that insanity ran through her family like a wild river. Then, Winnie's father rattled off numerous loonies in his family tree. Eventually, the defendant was pulled from the courtroom, but, as Nash replies, Winnie won. On April 24, 1933, Ruth returned to Phoenix. Her new home was located at the corner of Van Buren and 24th Streets. The whitewashed, stucco edifice locals called the Looney House, but to be correct, it was the Arizona State Mental Hospital. The Arizona State Mental Hospital, like most institutions of that nature in the first half of the 20th century, lacked proper facilities and offered little guidance. Hot, understaffed, short in benevolence but long on razor-strap discipline, these types of places were more bedlam than TLC. The establishment in Phoenix to which Winnie Ruth Judd was commuted was the most overcrowded in the country. Ruth found herself alive, true, but thrust into a world of abstracts, a place she could not understand. They said she was crazy. She often wondered herself if perhaps she was. But then, how come she was sane enough to sense the insanity of her situation? By now, having been yanked by fate to all corners of hysteria, she learned to accept small gifts of luck. She coped and made the best of her new home. Ruth became the unofficial beautician for many of the women patients, fixing them up for the occasional dances that the hospital sponsored for the inmates. Her work was so good that the nurses began visiting her, glad to pay her the small remuneration she charged. An aide at the asylum, Anne Keim, remembers Ruth distinctly. She was more like a member of the staff than a patient. She worked unusually hard, did more for that hospital than any two or three people. She wasn't crazy either. She was sane as anyone. Only one thing, Kime remembers, would drive Ruth over the edge, something very understandable considering all she'd been through. Jack Halloran would often show up at the dances, she said, merely to sneer and laugh real nasty at her, and she'd just go to pieces. The provoker was eventually banned from the grounds. Harry Whitmer, the institution's business manager during the 1940s, who came to know Ruth Judd well, became convinced of two things. As for being insane, no. Also, there was a major question in a lot of people's minds if she was guilty or not, or if she was just taking the rap. Ruth became an escape artist. During her 30-plus years of incarceration, from 1933 to 1971, she continuously gave the place the slip, usually for a brief period of time, then ultimately for nearly seven years. The board of directors babbled. They could not figure out how she was able to duck out despite precautionary measures. Years later, after she was given official freedom, Ruth admitted that one kind nurse, who realized the injustice handed her, had given her a key to the front door. Between 1939 and 1962, Ruth escaped seven times. October 24, 1939, for six days, she returned on her own. December 3, 1939, for several days. Grabbing a bus to Yuma, Arizona, 180 miles away, police found her there. For this escape, she was put into solitary confinement for 24 months, retained barefooted and in pajamas. May 11, 1947, for 12 hours. She absconded in broad daylight but was picked up that night hiding on the grounds of a nearby resort. November 29, 1951, for a few hours. Authorities located her, stuck in Phoenix. February 2, 1952, for five days. While on the lam, she remained in abetting friends' homes the while, eventually turning herself in. November 23, 1952, for two days. Escaped after Thanksgiving dinner and was found by police in the home of a friend. 
October 8, 1962, for six and a half years. This latter escape requires more than a capsule summary. Traipsing around Arizona for several months, hiding out, particularly in Kingman, Ruth wound up in Oakland, California. There, she utilized a pseudonym, Marion Lane, and even dared to apply at an unemployment agency for a local job. Her brother was financing her, but she wished to make a go of it on her own. Passing herself off as a maidservant, Ruth was hired by the extremely wealthy Nichols family of San Francisco to serve as both maid and sitter for the aging matriarch, affectionately called Mother Nichols. Her employer lived in a huge mansion overlooking the Bay Area. Up in years, she found Marion Lane the ideal helper and companion. She tended to the laundry, the cooking, the general housekeeping, and when Mother Nichols entertained, the setting up of delicate luncheons and afternoon teas. Ruth was in heaven. When the old lady passed away just before Christmas of 1967, the Nichols' relatives invited Marion to stay with them in a cottage they owned on their property north of San Francisco. Police found her there on June 27, 1969. They had traced her through the records of the State Driver's License Bureau. When Ruth had been found insane in 1933, the ruling had not altogether eradicated a possibility that she might eventually return to the gallows if she ever recovered her mind. With this looming fear, she time and time again appealed to the authorities to have that aberration removed. In 1952, with the help of some supporters, she was given another hearing to have the death penalty officially voided. Again, she described that terrible night. Again, she described Jack Halloran's flim-flam. Again, Jack Halloran dodged punishment. But first things first, and this time the first thing being her petition for leniency. The state freed her once and for all from the noose. Now, back in the custody of the asylum after her latest and longest escape, Ruth demanded a sanity hearing knowing that if she was found sane enough for the outside world, it wouldn't mean that she must die there. Having had a taste of the normal life, she yearned for freedom more than ever. She phoned the world-famous attorney Melvin Belly in 1969. He took her case immediately. Assisted by local Arizona attorney Larry Debus, Belly convinced the state parole board to review the case pending the possibility of release. In October 1969, Belly appeared before the hearing with a brilliant summary of her case, her life, and brought forth many witnesses to attest to Winnie Ruth Judd, her character, her innocence, and her sanity. Over decades, some things don't change. This was proven when the board denied parole. The attorneys campaigned. They built up such a cry for her release from among the American public and press that, when her case came up again before the same parole board in February 1971, it listened this time. After the parade of paparazzi, the testimony, the repetitions, and memories of so many years, the board declared, the case is not one you sweep under the rug and forget about. As time passes, more and more people will join the ranks of those who think her sentence should be commuted. What we will see is not a question of modern penology, but the portrayal of out-and-out -out persecution of an elderly grandmother-type unfortunate woman. It is incumbent upon the board to give her a commutation of the sentence now. Early morning, December 21, 1971, Governor of Arizona Jack Williams put pen to paper. That evening, Ruth walked out of the asylum, this time without dodging the lights. Winnie Ruth Judd returned to California as Marion Lane, where she lived in Stockton with her dog, Skeeter. She died at the age of 93 in her sleep, peacefully, on October 23, 1998. John McFadden, the lawman who saved her from the gallows in the nick of time, found his career politically ruined afterward. Expecting such, he retired from active duty. Embittered at the foulness of the men who ran him out of office for trying to help a human being, he claimed he would do it all over again, the same way, had he the chance. Jack Halloran was fired by his silent partners in his lumber business for the scandal he created. He eventually disappeared into oblivion. Many people today believe that he may even have been the man who killed the two girls. But of course, that cannot be, at this point in time, substantiated. Theorists say he promised Ruth that if she stood in for him on the killings, he would see that she was freed. He then paid his way out and walked away. Virginia Federer is one who believes Halloran was the killer. 
a daughter of an Arizona legislator in the state's early days. Federer stands by the story she told Jaina Bombersbach in 1990 about her meeting with them in the late 1930s. It was New Year's Eve, and Federer and her husband dined at the Adams Hotel, a hangout for local politicians. There, she says, they met Halloran. She goes on, someone asked him a question, like if he could take care of a problem, and he was bragging that, sure, he could fix it. Then he said, I can't recall his exact words, but it was to the effect that, if you knew the right people, you could fix anything in this town. He laughed and said that Winnie Ruth was out in the state hospital, paying for what he'd done. He was bragging about it. What sort of person was Winnie Ruth Judd? According to those who knew her, who spent real time with her, she was the flip side of everything the criminal court painted. Not a tigress, not vehement, not prone to either jealousy or abandon. Rather, she emanated, throughout her life and despite her troubles, a considerate quality of goodwill. Dark Horse Multimedia is fortunate to have among its readership Lynn Cisneros, who shares with us her personal recollection of Winnie Ruth Judd. As a child, Lynn spent three days and nights with the woman who the world sadly knew only as the trunk murderess. Her memories speak fondness and affection. After Ruth's seventh escape from the asylum in 1962, and before she ventured to California, she spent several months in the town of Kingman, Arizona. Kingman sits plunked in the scenic desert along the intersection of Interstate 40, west of Flagstaff, and U.S. Highway 93, south of Las Vegas. While in town, Ruth the Fugitive posts simply as Mrs. Ruth Judd, a married woman fleeing an abusive spouse. The local minister, Reverend Gisi and his wife, as well as the members of the local First Assembly of God Church, welcome the woman with open arms. Asking no questions, inviting her into its community of worshippers, the congregation found its newest member, whom they called Sister Ruth, to be a sweet, intelligent, soft-spoken lady who demonstrated a kind smile and expressed a warm heart to all she met. Sister Ruth was allowed to live in a small trailer adjacent to the church parking lot and accessible to the church. She lived alone with a Persian cat whom she called Whitey. The animal's color being obvious, laughed Cicernos. I've often wondered if the pastor knew her real identity and accommodated her because he recognized the true value in the real woman. He was that kind of man, very insightful. I really do believe he might have known. The congregation, Cicernos states, loved Ruth. They brought her food and helped her out in a number of ways, and, in turn, she returned whatever favors she could by doing domestic work for different families, cooking for them, cleaning for them. She earned a small income performing various chores, the money which would keep her in food and clothing. Cisneros remembers that Sister Ruth often led the singing at church and assisted in activities presented by the Missionettes, a girls' Christian club sponsored by the church in which Cisneros belonged. To a child my age, I was 11 years old at the time, Sister Ruth was a curiosity. She came out of nowhere and, well, was just there one day, as big as life. She didn't say much of encountering her on the streets or crossing the church lot, but she always extended a friendly greeting and magnificent smile. I'd see her out front of her place, talking to the pastor or just petting Whitey. She loved that cat. Cisneros remembers vividly that scar on the lady's left hand. One day she asked her about it and Sister Ruth explained that a long time ago she had been bitten by a spider. It was a terrible bite, she remarked. My index finger still occasionally goes numb. One day, little Lynn, who was then Lynn Dowling, received the shock of her life. I was and still am an avid reader, and I pored over the pages of the Arizona Republic with veracity. My father, then head of the town council, subscribed to the paper. Anyway, I happened to be reading the paper when I caught an article about the latest flight from justice of Winnie Ruth Judd, the trunk murderess. I felt my child's eyes nearly burst from their sockets 